Keith, uh, it looks oh, like you can us up first. Yeah hello. yeah, hello, Steve. Keith from Camas, Washington, zooming in here. Great. I got um, I want to take ask you more of a little bit of a personal type of question. You can go as deep as, as you want. I've always kind of been curious about this. Uh, let me set this up a little bit. When a, when a person or a man or woman or whoever goes into the trades, whether they feel their life's calling or they want to head into being an electrician or a builder, a carpenter, a plumber, a, a, they invest a great amount of money in their tools. And if you go in, you know, as a as a, a business owner, you start a business, you're, you're investing thousands into your, into your van or your truck and your tools. And you, Steve, as a, a man who's been called from a very young age um, to the ministry, to the preaching of the gospel, God has had his hand on your life from a very young age. Um, your, your tools were your books, correct? Pretty much. Uh, initially, just really my Bible and a concordance, you know. Yeah, yeah. and maybe, maybe you start out with a, a strongest yeah. concordance and a Haley Bible handbook. and uh, Yeah, I had that too. Uh, and that, but how, how, how did you, um, I know many times you said you were never a man of great means growing up or when you're married trying to survive and raise five kids and a wife and deal with the whole family life. How did the Lord, in terms of preparing you as a teacher and a preacher, equip you with a library over the 50 years you start? With nothing but a Bible and the Strong's, and then yeah, I don't and know. Now, fifty years I mean, later, you're. I've you're, got. I'm sure. I've got all my uh, my walls lined with full bookshelves, a floor to ceiling. Uh, now, yeah, I, when I started the ministry fifty three years ago, I I was dirt poor. I was only seventeen. I didn't have any money. Uh, I had been very fortunate, though. My father was quite a reader, and although he was not in the ministry, his taste was to read theology and apologetics and. Christian stuff, and he had quite a library of his own. Uh, not that he was a rich man, but he one thing he enjoyed doing with his time was to read, and so he invested in books. We had a, a one room in particular with lots of shelves of his books, so I had access to those when I when I was a child, and I actually used many of them when I was a child. They were often reference books or commentaries. Uh, there were several books that were about explaining uh, apparent contradictions in the Bible. I read those like crazy when I was young. Uh, but when I left home, when I was 17, I didn't have any money. Uh, I lived in a VW bus for the first six months and I had a Bible. I had, a, I think I had like a, a wooden box with all the books in it that I owned. The, the Bible is the main one I read. I had a, a strong concordance, a Haley's Bible handbook, um, I, a few miscellaneous books that weren't particularly study books, just books that Christians had recommended that were good. A watchman need books and things like that uh but not very many books i had just a few a couple of hands full of books i remember one christmas probably when i was 18 or 19 i got a a commentary for christmas from my parents which was a, a jameson Fawcett and brown commentary but it's one of those yeah. one of those single volume ones that had the whole bible one volume and had hardly any notes at all i i must say i've never used the commentary very much uh although it's not a bad one <clears throat> i just haven't didn't avail myself of it much i I mostly uh, got my teaching for free from going to Calvary Chapel. Frankly, I went every, every night to Calvary Chapel, and there was someone teaching the Bible every night. And I, uh, I, I guess I was kind of like a sponge. I just I wanted to know. I soaked it up. Uh, I read the Bible on my own all the time. Um, if I had to look something up, I could go to my dad's house and look at his books and so forth. But I was in the ministry for about twelve years before I owned many books at all. I, I suppose after after 12 years of ministry, I might've had 20 books. I'm not sure. Um, oh. I didn't have any money. But when I started the, the school in Oregon, a donor donated uh, $1,000 to get our library, the school library started. Oh. And, uh, now, $1,000 wouldn't buy many books today, but back in 1983, that actually went a long way. I got a, a Christian discount book house catalog. They didn't have a yeah. website. Yet, but they had the catalog yes. and I did not, I bought reference works I bought commentaries I bought uh special interest uh, topical Christian books on things and and I stocked a, a library pretty reasonably I mean I mean with a thousand dollars I probably was able to get maybe a hundred books 
in those days, maybe a little few, maybe a little fewer. But that's I felt like I hit the jackpot with books because I I simply bought books on everything I'd always wished I had books on, and uh, I used those a lot. But over over the years, uh, when I had any money to spend, I would generally buy something from the Christian Discount Book House uh, catalog. Some yeah, book yeah. Right there. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, when I I was running the school, people would donate their Christian book libraries to the school. You know, uh, like even even recently, uh, a, a, a young man in his forties died, and he and his mother were avid listeners to the Narrow Path. And he had run a Christian bookstore, and he had a lot of new uh, Christian books in his house and, and many bookshelves. And his after he died, his mother called me or texted me, or did email, I forget. And she said her son had died, and he would he knows if she knew he would want uh, to offer those books to me if I wanted them. And so my wife and I got a, borrowed a truck and went over and got boxes and boxes of books. We didn't keep all of them; we gave a lot of them away, but. I've got shelves and shelves full of the books he gave me, and, and they gave me bookshelves too. So I just, you know, I've accumulated books over time. Uh, my <clears throat> my ministry didn't depend on books an awful lot in the first, but uh, before I started the school, so in the first twelve years of my ministry, yeah. uh, when I did start the school, I had to teach every book verse by verse for the students, and I there were certain you know, books that were pretty hard for me to understand in those days, and and uh, so I I'd read commentaries on those I'd, I'd, I'd study the best I could find on it um, mm -hmm. when you um so, excuse me a sec. when you I've heard you mention many times when you write your books you reference as many of you read 25 to 50 books on the particular subject that you're going to write on mm -hmm. are all those books in your library do you uh, <laughs> Research Most, online. What's yeah, well, when I was writing when I was writing the Four Views of Revelation book back in 1997, <laughs> or I, was, I guess I was writing it in '96. Um, I didn't have much money for commentaries, but there was a in in Salem, Oregon, uh, which was uh, less than an hour's drive from where I lived. There was a Baptist Bible College, and and I was able to go into their library and check out commentaries on Revelation. They had over a hundred commentaries on Revelation. I, oh. I had a few myself, but not anywhere near as many as I used. I actually used 50. And when I say used them, I read the bulk of most of them oh. uh, to, to gather from them, you know, the, the best arguments on each few. So, but I wouldn't have been able to buy those books. There, too many, there was a, a library, a seminary library, really, that was available. When it came to the uh, Hell book, I read about, um, I'm thinking about, thinking about I'd say it's about maybe about 30 books. Yeah, probably about 30 books on hell uh, oh, yeah. from a, a relatively similar number from each view. I bought those books uh, by by that time. Um, I, I I had more, um, you know, more available uh, money than I was younger to, to buy books. And things. so, right. and I read those too. Yeah. But right. uh, today, uh, Today, I, I mean, I have more books than I'll be able to read, but I still buy books uh, if there's something good. Uh, yeah. It's part of your calling, Steve. It's who you are. It's your it's your it's your gifting. You've got to read to let us know <laughs> to inform you know to inform us. I have to say, in the beginning, I was I was learning uh, for myself. Uh -huh. That is not not to not that not so I could be a teacher. Uh, I, you know, I, I I studied everything I could on the Bible because I. I just wanted to know it. Right. Yes. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as as I learned more, there were people who wanted me to teach them. And then when I started school, I really had to study, you know, books and stuff like that. I mean, I wanted to anyway, but I, yes, I mean, amen. I've always amen. wanted to. Study, you know. The Lord, the Lord's equipped you. You have to say your testimony of the Lord's equipped you all the way along for what you. He's given you what you need to do your to fulfill Thanks. your calling. Yeah, I believe so, but. I have to say, I never really liked school. Uh, I was not a good student in school. I didn't like classroom study. Oh, uh, wow. I, I felt, I, of course, I'm talking about secular school. Uh, I didn't go to any other kind. But um, yeah, I, 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 I wanted to get out of school as quick as I could. Never wanted to be in school. Even from like first and second grade, I wanted to get out of school. But when I did get out of school, I wanted to read all the time. I wanted to learn all the time, but not what they yeah. were teaching in school. Yeah. yeah. What 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 kind of advice? Last question. What kind of advice would you give uh, 
a young Steve Gregg, you know, um, nowadays, would you steer him toward Bible college? Would you steer him toward um, online learning? What, 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 how would you direct him? Well, if it was me, a young me, if I could go back and give counsel a young me, I would have first of all told myself that I had time to go to school because the rapture is not going to come in the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that I could actually have time to go to school, but I'm not sure I would have thought that I needed to. The only thing I wish I had gone to school for was to learn Greek and Hebrew because oh, yeah. I've got books on it. And I, and I, you know, I learned anecdotally looking up words and, and stuff in commentation. I mean, I learned, I've learned quite a bit about Greek and Hebrew, New and Old Testament, but I can't just sit down and read it. And, I, and that's something you could learn in seminary or, or Bible college. And that's the only thing I have found that I couldn't teach myself uh, that I could have learned in school. Uh, right. But I will say this, uh, there was a, a, a brother, uh, a teacher I knew uh, who had a doctorate. And when he, he was a theologian, when he heard that I didn't, I, this is when I was young, when he heard that I hadn't been to Bible college, he said, oh, you really need to learn Greek. You need to learn Greek. And he and we had lunch together. He was telling me that. Then he heard me teach that night. And he came up to me afterwards and said, you know what, what I said about you need to learn Greek? Forget it. He says, he says you've got a command of the English Bible like I've never seen before. So I, and I, he says, I don't think you're that desperately in need of knowing Greek. But I still would love to know it. I'd still, I, I still use my Greek resources all the time, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, thanks for the peek behind the curtain, Steve. I like to appreciate that. All right, brother. Good talking to you. Yep. Okay, thanks for joining us. Yes. Let's talk to Boyd Griffin. Hello, Boyd. Good to see you again. Yeah, hi, Steve. I um, wanted to start off by thanking you for your website and the materials on it. And I, I know you said this on one of your programs, but I just want to say it for, for everybody. Um, because it's so pertinent right now that in your What Are We to Make of Israel, that those last two lectures about the, the background of, of Israel is, is really great to hear. A modern uh, yes. Yeah, and, uh, just interviewed on a podcast this morning, uh, the president of something like Covenant Theological Seminary and another guy from there, they have a podcast and they interviewed me this morning on that very subject, which they're going to post somewhere. They're going to send me a link. Go ahead. And and also to thank you, um, your answer today to Peter when he called in from from uh, England was was really good. It, it, it kind of went with the question that I'd asked before. I, okay. I was cleaning my desk off and I found um, a notepad from I don't know when. <laughs> and it had a, had a uh, question I was going to ask you. Um, I don't remember if I asked you or not because that's an age related issue. Uh, so I'll ask it again uh, if, if I did. Um, this is Mouse walking past me. Um, so um, the question is whether or not Moses was circumcised. The Midrash says that he was born circumcised and that Pharaoh's daughter recognized he was a Hebrew when he was in the basket. But other people say in Exodus 4, 18 through 31, it implies Moses as an adult was not circumcised. And I, I don't get that when I read that but just wondering what your thoughts it depends, are. It depends on what version you read of, of Exodus chapter four. There's uh, from, from the new King James and the King James, which I have used most of my life. It sounds like uh, when God encountered Moses at the encampment in Exodus chapter four, that it was his child that needed to be circumcised mm -hmm. uh, and was at that point. Um, there are some translations that render that whole, uh, that whole verse a little differently and makes it sound like it was Moses that had to be circumcised. Um, so uh, this is an area where I don't even know if, if being a Hebrew scholar would help because obviously all translations are made by Hebrew scholars and they don't all agree. But uh, apparently there's some ambiguity whether the circumcision that took place there was of Moses. And if so, he was certainly an adult. He was 80 years old at that point. Uh, or if it was his son. I've always taken it to be his son. I always figured it was that Moses neglected to circumcise his son. Uh, there's no reason why Moses would not have been circumcised by his family when he was born. Uh, because, uh, you know, they kept him for several months and he would only have to be circumcised on the eighth day. And the, and the command for all male Jews to be circumcised on the eighth day went back to Abraham centuries mm -hmm. earlier. 
So unless the Jews were very negligent, uh, uh, you know, at that particular time in Egypt, uh, then Moses almost certainly would have been circumcised as a baby. And, and that would suggest that chapter four is describing not his circumcision, but that of his son. Okay. And that, and that would go along with um, Pharaoh's daughter recognizing he was a Hebrew, or is there any, any other way that oh, could be. she would I mean, could be. She, There may have been other things. I mean, she might just deduce why, why is this baby abandoned in the river? Mm -hmm. uh, well, oh, my dad just said that all the Hebrew babies have to be thrown in the river to die, and some innovative Jewish mother has thrown her child in the river not to die. And she could have figured it out, or it could be that she saw him circumcised. You're right. That's very possible. That would be a dead giveaway. Okay. Thank you. All right. God bless you. All right. Mike Lucero. Hello. Yeah, how are you doing, Steve? Good. Um, so my question is, what what are your thoughts on like the whole field of astrophysics and like theoretical type sciences? Uh, it, it seems to me it's it's almost as um, like outlandish to believe in some of that because it's all theory. We're talking about such large, you know, spaces and, that, you know, th there's really no way they could like verify it. It's it's as outlandish as evolution to me. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I don't know if it is or not. I've studied evolution far more than I know anything about astrophysics. Astrophysics is, uh, I guess we could say it is rocket science, and I don't know much about it. Um, I have wondered, as a layman might, how it is that they have become so sure that these stars are 5 billion light years away and that the sun is 93 million miles away. Um, they have, I'm, I'm sure they have ways of measuring those kind of things fairly accurately, but I, I don't know what those measurement tools are. Um, I don't find it to be as, as much of a concern to me what their theories may be as I find evolution to be, because evolution obviously is a, a direct slap in the face of creation. Whereas the, the, the theories of the astrophysicists as to the size of the universe and things like that could be entirely true without coming up against any particular biblical doctrine on the subject. Um, uh, so I, I, I guess I've never made it an issue to challenge, although I have sometimes wondered, how do they know these things? And, are, and is it really true? I mean, is this something they, they have really proven or something that sort of like the age of the earth, they've kind of decided, you know, that that's the paradigm they're working with. So they interpret everything in that, in that light. Uh, I can't help you with that. I don't know enough about, you know, the dependability of their methods of measurement and things like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, thanks, brother. All right. God bless you. Thank you. Kevin, welcome. If you can help me reconcile a couple of verses, I would appreciate it. And then also give me your opinion on... Um, what type of eschatology will be dominant as we transition away from dispensational thought? The two verses I need to reconcile are Matthew 24, 36 mm -hmm. and 2 Peter uh, 3, 12. On the one hand, Jesus tells the disciples, no one knows the hour uh, that the Father is going to send the Son. But yet Peter feels comfortable saying that we can hasten his return yeah so he must he must have had some information from jesus that let him know that um if we mature at a faster rate we can actually affect the rate well, at which the father is going to send the son I, I could easily uh conclude that peter was basing the idea that this could be hastened on the uh, fact that Jesus said that in, in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. So uh, obviously, if it requires that the gospel be preached to all nations before the end can come, and if Jesus is in fact referring to the end of the world, the second coming, which I suspect is very prob probable, then uh, then maybe that's what Peter's thinking. You know, we can, we can hasten, we can bring this on more quickly, no one knows the day or the hour, and Peter didn't claim that he did. But if there's something that is a project that God is waiting to be finished before he returns, and we're involved in that project, 
and then it would seem like our diligence in it would be a form of uh, you know hastening it. And it's possible that one reason that no one knows the day or the hour that Jesus is going to come is because that's flexible. Uh, you know, it could be it could it could be um, postponed somewhat by by inactivity on the part of the church in evangelizing the world. Or, or it could perhaps be sped up, as Second Peter, you know, sounds like it's saying. Now, as far as eschatology, what was your question about eschatology again? And then, so you know, we're in that sort of dispensational time frame here. You know, we we've talked about this before. I don't see any verses that say that the generation can exceed eighty years from nineteen forty-eight. And I know you said Hal Lindsey said he thought a hundred years. Yeah. But I can't find anything in there that says 100 years. But it seems to me that even though I don't believe in dispensationalism, that we have to acknowledge that the clock has not run out on them. And they still do have an excess of, what, uh, four years here, right, to have everything kind of come in order. So until that happens, uh, we have to at least give them the, the benefit of the doubt. But as we transition beyond that, and and it doesn't materialize, where do you think most dispensational Christians will fall regarding eschatology? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the Bible never tells us how long a generation is. I think Hal Lindsey might have gotten the number 100 from the fact that in Genesis chapter 14, God predicted to Abraham that his uh, offspring would be slaves in a foreign land named Egypt for uh, 400 years. And then he referred to that later in the same sentence as uh, the fourth generation. They'll come back in the fourth generation, which okay. how Lindsay might be thinking, well, okay, 400 years is four generations then. So that'd be 100 years per generation. I, mm. I don't remember him making that argument, but when I heard him suggest it, I thought, well, he's probably thinking of that passage because, I mean, that would be a fairly sensible thing for him to think. The problem is, but you say until until the time runs out. So I mean, if if he's right and that time that generation begins in 1948, then it wouldn't be till uh, you know 2048 uh, mm -hmm. or excuse me, yeah, 2048, right? So uh, um, so that's a ways out there for a while. You say, well, then we have to you know, we have, they can still hold out hope that they're uh, that they're correct in their view. Uh, well, okay. the problem with it, the reason that I don't give them the benefit of that is because their whole assumption is wrong that, that Jesus is making reference to 1948. Uh, there, see, in Matthew 24, Jesus says, learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its uh, twigs are tender and it puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. And he says, even so, when you see these things begin to pass, come to us, know that it is near, even at the doors. Uh, verily, I say to you, this generation will not pass before all these things come. Now, he didn't say anything about a generation won't pass from the time that the fig tree buds. In fact, he's not even predicting a uh, a fig tree budding. The dispensationalists assume that uh, the, the budding of the fig tree is symbolic for the restoration of the name of it, uh, the state of Israel. Now, the Bible and Jesus never mention any restoration of the state of Israel. There's no there's no reference to it in the New Testament. So there's no reason why his disciples would be expected to think that this generic illustration from nature, which is when you see tender twigs and new leaves on a fig tree after winter, uh, you know that summer's coming. And just like that, when you see the other things I'm talking about, you'll know that it is coming, the thing that he's predicting. So to me, that's not really any different than when Jesus said, you Pharisees are hypocrites, you can discern from the face of the sky. If the sky is red in the evening, uh, you're going to have a, a nice weather tomorrow. If it's red in the morning, you're going to have bad weather. He says, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the, times, uh, the, the signs of the times. In other words, he's, he's making a connection from weather and from trees and from nature. You can see uh, harbingers of things that are coming. You can see what the weather is coming like by the color of the sky. You can see that summer is near by fig trees, you know, after the winter, putting out new growth. Uh but neither of those things are, you know, the sky turning red is not a symbol of anything. And the fig tree putting out new uh, growth is not a symbol of anything. At least he doesn't say that it is. He just says, like you can tell from that, that this is going to happen. 
So also you can tell from the signs I've given you that this other thing is going to happen. So there's a, a parallel, but it's not a, not a symbolic identity of anything. So to suggest that the budding of the fig tree somehow has a connection to 1948 and the reestablishment of the nation of Israel is uh, strictly artificial. I mean, there's nothing in the Bible to uh, justify that premise. So if there was, and then... And then if Jesus said, and the and the generation that sees that happen will not pass until everything is done. Okay, well, if 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 there was a reason to say the fig tree was 1948 and that Jesus predicted that the generation that saw that would, would not perish before these all happened, well, then we'd have to speculate, well, how long does Jesus think a generation is anyway? But there's not a reason in the world that a, a biblical exegete uh, who actually cares about exegesis would read into that fig tree statement a reference to Israel. In fact, those who say that Israel is specifically, uh, or that the fig tree is specifically a, a symbol of Israel, need to compare what Jesus said there with the parallel in, in Luke, where uh, in the parallel he says, consider the fig tree and all the trees. When they begin to put out new growth, then you know summer is there. So, I mean, He's just talking about trees in general. He's not talking about the fig tree as a specific image of something. And when he says this generation will not pass, he didn't say that generation will not pass. He didn't say that, you know, the generation that's in some future time that sees this it will not pass. He's saying this generation, his own, would not pass uh, until all these things come true. Now, honestly, uh, this generation, many people have suggested other meanings for it. Some people think it means this race, like the Jewish race. So there's no reference to the Jewish race in his in his whole uh, discourse otherwise, and uh, and there no one ever asked any questions about whether the Jewish race would pass away. So why would he have to make a comment about that? Um, but the truth is, of course, the, the temple that they asked about was destroyed, as they had asked about in that actual generation, uh, you know, within 40 years of the prediction. So there's no reason to look for more esoteric meanings when the obvious meaning is true. Um, so I, now when dispensationalism, uh, you know, is abandoned, uh, you know, what will take its place? I, I don't know. There's other options. Uh, I, I I know many people who've already abandoned uh, dispensationalism. They haven't all gone the same direction. Some have gone into historic premillennialism. My friend Dennis, the millennialist, who calls me so often and wants to argue, with me, he's, he's abandoned. He, when he first started calling me, 20 years ago, he called himself Dennis the Dispensationalist. Uh, I talked him out of that. So for many years now, he's been calling himself Dennis the Millennialist. And, but he's not dispensational. He's historic premillennial. So is uh, Michael Brown, Dr. Michael Brown, the Jewish uh, Christian guy that I debate too. But, but I and many others I know have went from dispensationalism into amillennialism. I know some people who went from there into postmillennialism. I, I can't predict where most of them will go. Um, probably any, uh, probably any lifeboat will be acceptable when the ship is going down. All right. Brother Steve, thank you very much for your time. Have thank a good you. evening. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Linda, welcome to the Narrow Path, uh, Zoom meeting. Linda, thank by you. the way, L Linda yeah. is, is the widow of the man who used to, uh, used to handle all our finances for us until he died a few years ago. And, and he was uh, one of the best friends of this ministry for many, many years. Um, yeah. I still and, miss him. Uh, yeah, I do too. Yeah. Anyway, I just finished reading Against Our Better Judgment by Allison Weir. You recommended it in your, yeah. the end of your series on what, to, what are we to make of modern Israel? Mm -hmm. Which the book lays to rest the notion that the existence of Israel is a miracle. You know, it just, I couldn't believe all the behind the door dealings and the influence of Zionism. So my question is, is Zionism still an influence today? And if so, how much? Um, are there Israelis that are Zionists? Do we still have Zionists in our um, state departments and in the UN? I'm just, just wondering, are there still those I'm behind sure. the scenes dealings? Insofar as Zionist is simply the belief that uh, is that the Jews should have uh, the nation of Israel, the land of Israel, for their uh -huh. possession, 
Yeah, I mean, almost all almost all the conservatives in our government are Zionists by default. Not that not that you have to be a Zionist to be a conservative, but um, you know, it's been the position of conservative uh, America to be pro-Israel. Uh, whether people had a theological basis for for it or not, I mean, mm-hmm. obviously Israel has been a, an ally of, of the United States from the beginning, and uh, so we we tend to stand with our allies, uh, as I believe people should. People should stand. So, if you're pro-Israel, you're considered a Zionist, then? Well, not necessarily. You might be. Uh, obviously. Uh, People who believe it's important for the Jews to go back to their land are Zionists. Mm-hmm. Uh, not everyone who's pro-Israel thinks it's particularly important for all the Jews in Europe to go back to the land. Mm-hmm. The people who believe that would be, uh, you know, secular and and Jewish Zionists, of whom I, I don't know what the percentage is. I mean, most of the Israelites are uh, most of the Jews in Israel are secular. How many of them are Zionists? I don't know, because Zionism was started by a secular Jew. It was a secular mm-hmm. political movement before religion got involved with it at all. It, it, it wasn't started by a bunch of Jews who thought, hey, you know, the Bible says we're supposed to go back and own this land in the end times or something like that. You know, that that was what they weren't thinking in those terms. Oh, they just wanted to get out of Europe and get and have a land to control for themselves. Um, and, and I don't know what percentage of the people in Israel now are Zionists. Uh, as far as Christians go, uh, dispensationalists are yeah. are Zionists by definition, uh, and many uh, historic uh, premillennialists are. I mean, Dr. Michael Brown is my friend Dennis, the millennialist, uh, very much a Zionist, and they believe that's you know that's part of the end time prophecy. So I, I think Christians, dispensational and premillennial Christians, are more adamantly Zionist than any movement within the, among the Jews that I'm aware of now. But then I don't follow the movements in the Jews. There's lots of different uh, Jewish sub-movements, and I'm sure many of them are Zionists. I just read an article by a Palestinian who said, we don't hate Jews, we hate Zionist Jews. Mm. So he was making a distinction. I just wondered, you know, in Israel, how many Jews are Zionists? But Yeah, I don't know. I think probably a lot of people went to Israel because they were Zionists. Right. Uh, but of course, that was—that's been over the past seventy-five years. Israel's been a nation. There's no doubt two or three generations have been born there and might not have any opinion at all about Zionism. You know, it's just right. where they were born. You know, that's where they live, and and no doubt they have a, a vested interest in keeping control of it, just like America has a vested interest in keeping control of this country. I mean, I didn't—I didn't drive the Indians out. I, I I think some bad things were done when the Indians were driven out, but it wasn't me that did it. And it wasn't any modern Indians that were that were driven out. Of course, they have been abused on, you know, in some respects. But they've also been reparations been made to the Indians too. I mean, they own all the casinos, uh, and the government gives them a lot of money, uh, you know. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't. I will not take responsibility for what happened to the Indians two hundred years ago. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know that someone who was born in Israel in the past seven hundred years needs to take any responsibility for what. Uh, what their ancestors did, you know, in taking that country. Um, so I, I just think no human being is born into a geopolitical system that has always existed. Right. Uh, every nation there is uh, was formerly uh, inhabited by and and run by some other group of people, and mm-hmm. in conquest and intertribal you know exterminations and things like that have, have changed the land ownership everywhere and uh and so i i wouldn't think it makes sense for anyone america or israel to say well you know some things were done wrong in the past so we should stop being a nation you know right. if, if we need to then everyone needs to because everyone displaced somebody else you know right. um, so I, I just think I'm not against the the nation of Israel. I'm certainly uh, I look askance at some of the things they did. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, we have to look askance at a lot of things the Palestinians did too. There's there's some nasty behavior on both sides. Um, but as far as that goes, I mean, I would just judge Israel day by day by the current situation. I'm not going to condemn them for what happened 
in 1948. I, I just, you know, what they do today is what's going to affect my judgment. At this point, I'm fairly pro-Israel. I mean, in, the, in this present conflict, I'm right. not. Saying, I'm not saying they're not doing anything wrong. I don't know if they are or not. I don't think they're angels, but uh, it looks to me like this was provoked by their enemies, and uh, and right. I think I think they have a right to retaliate. Well, you mentioned also in that lecture that a rabbi had criticized their retaliation method as two eyes for an eye. Mm -hmm. You gave an example of like 10 eyes for an eye. So I'm just, you know, yeah. I'm just concerned this Gaza thing will be 10 eyes for an eye. I know. I know. And I, I'm not a, I'm not a, 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 a I'm not, I'm not an expert at any statecraft right. in the Middle East or anywhere else, but, um, I mean, and I have limited information. We only get the information that comes to us, although we have the internet. We don't know which which information is, here is true. Um, so, I mean, if I was over there, I might I might get it from the horse's mouth somewhat more. But uh, the impression I have is, of course, uh, Israel in this present conflict have killed a lot more people than in the initial attack against them on, was it the 7th of October? Mm -hmm. But but they're not simply trying to do an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. They're trying to save their nation from uh, a permanently hostile and very unscrupulous uh, group of terroristic uh, leaders of, of of Gaza. Now, the people of Gaza, I don't know what I don't know what responsibility they bear for electing Hamas as their leadership. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, they may have done it at gunpoint. They might not like them at all. Um, I've heard reports, usually from the Zionist side, that most people in uh, Gaza would prefer to be under Israeli rule than, than Hamas rule. That I could understand why they would. Uh, but um, on the other hand, uh, I, I don't know. Israel's kind of between a, a rock and a hard place. How how can they not retaliate when women and children were simply, I mean, if they just do nothing, that's just going to let Hamas be encouraged to keep doing it. And and their other enemies too, and we know that Hamas is determined to keep doing that kind of thing until they get wiped out. Nothing short of wiping them out will right. change their plans. So uh, I'm, I'm not speaking here as a what a Christian should do to his enemies, but but what a nation needs to do for its own survival militarily. Uh, Israel may not be doing anything worse than we were doing when we bombed Hiroshima. You know, I mean, uh, we had to bring an end to the conflict once and for all. Unfortunately, there were civilians who were you know collateral damage uh I, I i don't i i'm not unsympathetic it's just that i'm not the one who's involved in the war i'm not the one who's going to make any strategies for the war i'm just saying that if it's a war uh and your enemy is uh, scurrilous enough to not wear uniforms so you don't know who they are to hide mm -hmm. between, hide behind women and children in hospitals so that you can't get them uh but they're going to keep coming after your people I'd say that, I don't know, desperate times call for desperate measures. I just don't know what the right measures are. I'm not I'm not critical of Israel for retaliating at this point, even though they've taken out a lot more of the uh, of the Palestinians. I one thing I will say this, I'm pretty sure, I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure the, that Israel at this point is not trying to target civilians ever in war. I mean, they do they have done some oppressive things to Palestinians in, in peacetime. But it, in this war, I think they specifically have it as their mission to get rid of Hamas, which is not innocent and which is, uh, you know, which which did target civilians. I mean, when they attacked Israel, they targeted babies and and women and and did horrible things uh, against unarmed people. Now there's unarmed civilians being killed in in Gaza now by Israeli missiles and so forth. But Israel didn't want them to be there. He, you know, they they said, "Hey, get out of there! Get out of there! We're going to bomb this place." And if if the people of Hamas didn't let them get away, and they get killed because they're in a war zone, I don't know how Hamas doesn't own that. You know, I don't. I don't right. see how Israel can be said, "Okay, well, I guess we just won't fight our enemies because they're being so unscrupulous as to keep civilians in the war zone." Well. I'm I'm awfully glad I don't command a, co a country or, or right. A so yeah. confusing. It's awful. Yeah, terrible. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good to talk to you, Linda. Yeah. Say hi right. to Dana. All right. God bless you.
Uh, Brian, how are you doing? I want to talk about um, the, I don't see it as quite a contradiction, but maybe there's some friction there. And I wanted to see, uh, I, I kind of have an answer in my head, but I kind of want to see what you have to say about the comparison between the, the parable of the sower and uh, specifically like the seed that fell on the rocky soil mm -hmm. and, uh, and Philippians 1, 6. We it know seems like there's kind of a friction there, but just curious what you have to say about it. Okay. Where, where, where Paul said that he that began the good work in you form it. Yeah. Right. Um, well, uh, okay. The rocky soil in the parable of the sower was, uh, you know, hard, rocky uh, soil covered with a, a little bit of to soft topsoil. So the seed penetrated and had enough soil to begin growing, but did, because of the rock underneath, the seed's roots couldn't go down. So when the sun came up, it burned the plant and it died. And Jesus said, that's those who receive the word of God with joy and, and they begin to grow, but they are uh, they have no root in themselves. So when tribulation and persecution come because of the word, they quickly fall away. So these are people who seemingly had a good start, of a shallow one, but still a real one. They were alive, which suggests that... Uh, you know, you can fall away. I mean, that's certainly what Jesus, in, in in Luke's version of that parable, in Luke 8, he says specifically, these are those who believe for a while, and then they fall away. So they're believers. They're not unbelievers and, uh, for a while. Now, when Paul says to the Philippians that he who began the good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus, I, I think he's speaking of his confidence uh, for the church as a whole. I don't think he's. Uh, I don't think he knows every person in the church. Uh, it was a pretty small church at first, because uh, there were no Jews in that town, and it was that Lydia, you know, was the one who started the church in her home with a few people. But it apparently grew rapidly till there's, you know, a church big enough to be represented. And women are mentioned in Philippians that aren't mentioned in Acts. So there's new members. I don't know if Paul knew all the people in the church. If if there were hundreds then probably not. Uh, in other words, he wouldn't necessarily be speaking to the individual, that I know you're going to make it. I know you're going to persevere to the end. If he did say that, um, he might have said that in a, just an optimistic, encouraging way, saying God is able to keep you, you know, certainly. I know God is able to do this thing for you, but I'm, you know, uh, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt that you're going to stick with him, and then he'll perfect you. Um, that, that could be his thought. Or he could simply be saying to the church as a whole, I believe that God planted this church and he's going to bring this church to its proper maturity. You know, he's he began a good work in you that is in the church in Philippi uh, without making any particular predictions about every person who happened to attend their meetings or, or you know, be in that group. Uh, which could mean that, you know, indeed the church will be persevering. The church will be brought to maturity. Um but without saying that every person in that church is uh, comes under that promise if they don't persevere themselves. So I've, I've yeah that I've, I've been aware of that uh, tension for many years, and I've uh, the way I've dealt with it is to see him saying that about the church as a whole rather than as uh, a promise to each of the individuals in the church. Uh, but again, if if he was talking, wanted every individual to take that as a promise. Then I I would be more inclined to see him saying is this is something I want you to realize God can do you know he if you, if you're faithful to him he will bring you to perfection too he started something in you which tells you that he's committed to it and if you're committed to him hey sky's the limit as far as your maturity and your success in the Christian faith yeah sounds like we're pretty close on the same page I was. I was thinking that uh, very similarly that he was probably talking to specific people uh, that he just had confidence in in their faith uh, rather okay. than r rather than to you know every believer worldwide. Uh, it just seems like uh, maybe I'm hanging around uh, <laughs> some people with Calvinistic leanings that uh, want to believe in the perseverance of the saints, and yeah, uh, yeah and I I just I think that they're. They're, they're taking that, that verse and expanding it too far farther than it, it sounds like it. 
Yeah, maybe. you can't use a, a verse that has more than one possible meaning like that, that has a, that degree of ambiguity, and use it to uh, to cancel out a doctrine that is spoken of un unambiguously. You know, right. Many, yeah. right. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Say hi to uh, Mike for me. Will do. God bless. All right. Okay, Jacob. How you doing? Steve, how are you doing? Good. Good. I've talked with you before about uh, this passage, but I didn't get the specific question answered that um, is still on my mind. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so in Jeremiah, Jeremiah spoke of the new covenant in um, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, or excuse me, chapter 8, verse 13, it says, and then he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So my question has to do with the timing of this. If it was when Jeremiah said it, that it was passing away, or if it's when the writer of Hebrews is writing, it's passing away. Mm. And I don't know if I should think of that as with the death of Christ, when he said it is finished and the new covenant in my blood. Um, or if I should think of some 80, 70 thing, which hasn't really entered into my figuring. Yeah. Well, as I see it, uh, it's not Jeremiah who, who is, uh, is saying that in his day, you know, uh, 600 BC, uh, that the old covenant was ready to pass away. Of course, it wasn't ready to pass away in 600 BC. Uh, and we see that Jesus in the upper room brings in the new covenant. But it is clearly the new covenant that Jeremiah had predicted. So, so Jeremiah is talking about something far off in his future, though it comes to reality in Jesus. Now, the writer of Hebrews is writing a few decades even after that. He's living, as are all Christians at that time and now, in the new covenant. The new covenant had been established in, through Jesus. And uh, the writer of Hebrews, I believe, is writing shortly before 70 AD. And so uh, he's reminding those Jews, those Jewish Christians, that God had said there'd be a new covenant because his readers are Jewish Christians who are thinking about going back to the old covenant. And he's trying to say, wait, 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 didn't you read? You know, there's a, Jeremiah said there's going to be a new covenant. And his subtext is, and now there is, of course, because of Jesus. And since there is, the old one uh, is obsolete. Now, now he says this to people of his own time. The writer says, and that which is obsolete is about ready to vanish away. I believe what he's saying is all the trappings of that covenant, the temple and the priesthood and the sacrificial system, all that stuff of the old covenant, it's going to vanish away soon. And I think he's referring to AD 70. So he's saying, you know, he's kind of scanning time. He, he quotes Jeremiah, who spoke 600 years before Christ. Uh, and then uh, and then he, uh, you know, alludes to or, or presumes as a subtext the fact that that new covenant that Jeremiah spoke of has come about in Christ and that he and his readers are living in that new covenant. And then he says, and so obviously the new covenant has made the old one obsolete, which is his polemic for don't go back. Don't go back to the temple system. Don't go back to the old covenant. It's obsolete. And then he says, and by the way, from the point in time that he's writing, uh, that which is obsolete is about ready to vanish away. That's why I believe he wrote it shortly before 70 AD. It's, uh, his arguments make sense only in that time frame. So I think the vanishing away of the old covenant that he's predicting would soon happen is 70 AD, but it's already obsolete. What's going what's mm -hmm. to disappear in 70 AD is that which has already been rendered obsolete by the coming of the new covenant in 30 AD by Jesus. Okay, a little bit confusing, but... Uh... I think I got your perspective on it now. I was thinking the other way, but uh, I'll have to rework my thinking. Okay. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. God bless okay, you. Bye. All right. Uh, uh, Moto. <laughs> I think that's your phone. Uh, Motorola, probably. I don't know. Hi. You're the one whose name is Moto on the screen. Hey, Steve. This is Mike. I usually call from Inglewood, California. Okay. Cool. And I first I wanted to thank you for your patience that I see that you show. Um, it's as, it's actually teaching me um, patience on my on my own. And um, Praise the Lord. 
Thank you for your book as well. Um, my question is, coming from a um, non-denominational non point of view, trying to explain to a oneness indoctrinated person the Trinitarian, Trinitarian view, how would you possibly explain John 8, 58, um, I, where he said, I am, uh -huh. um, John 10, 30, where he said, I and my father are, are one, mm -hmm. and Matthew 28, 19, where he said, um, in the yeah. name. The father. Uh, sing, yeah. How could you explain that Jesus to a oneness is not God the Father? Well, uh, because despite those statements, Jesus often said that he was distinguished from the Father. He said, I didn't come to do my own will, but my Father's will. I'm not here to glorify myself, but to glorify my Father. Um, I bear witness of myself, but there's two witnesses because my Father also bears witness of me. So his Father is, is a second witness along with him. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things. And even in the place... Uh, you know, in John 14, where Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, before the chapter is over, he says, the Father is greater than I am. So we have this, what should we say, mystery, that Jesus often speaks as if he is God, uh, and therefore we accept that he is. But he also speaks as if the Father, who also is God, is in some way distinguishable from him, and simultaneously so. I mean, the oneness people would say that, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, God was the Father, but during the Incarnation, he was the Son. And after Pentecost, he's the Holy Spirit, but he's never the Father and the Son at the same time, or the Holy Spirit and the Son at the same time, or the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're, you know, he's a one, one person going through different transitions from Father to Son to Holy Spirit, uh, whereas the Trinity doctrine is, no, the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit are all indeed God, they're all the one God, in some sense that is extremely difficult for any of us to understand, and anyone who thinks they can, uh, I suspect they're bluffing. But um, but he his words, if you take all his words, cannot suggest that he is the Father with no remainder. You know, he's, he's basically, he and the Father are one, he said in John 10, 30, which... Uh, now, I have to say, uh, though I'm Trinitarian, and that's always a favorite Trinitarian verse, uh, I have to say there's, there is a possibility that he simply means the Father and I are on the same page. We're of one accord. You know, and now, Jehovah's Witnesses say that, so we don't want to say that. Uh, but that particular statement in context could mean that. Uh, but I have no difficulty with him meaning the Father and I are one in essence, although I don't know that that's I, I, actually, I think that's how his hearers heard him, because they took up stones to stone him. And he said, I've done many good works in your in your presence. For which of these do you stone me? And he said, well, they said, not for a good work, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. So when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, they apparently took it to mean that he was in essence God, even if, uh, even if the statement could be taken with less offense in a different way. Um, I, would, I would tell a oneness person this that I can appreciate the difficulty in understanding and accepting the Trinity. I myself have no difficulty accepting it, but I do have difficulty understanding it. I don't know that we have quite the frame of reference to understand it, and I don't even know that we're required to understand I hope not. Uh, I don't think we're required to understand it. But, uh, but there are things about God that are that I don't have to understand in order to know him personally and walk with him, be obedient to him. There are things about his essence that are no doubt really, really far above my pay grade to fully to fully grasp. But I cannot reduce the mystery by eliminating some set of verses. This is the problem. You know, the, we've got verses that call Jesus God. We've got verses that call the Father God. And we've got verses that call the Holy Spirit God. We've got verses that distinguish between Jesus and the Father. And we've got verses that distinguish between Jesus and the Holy Spirit, though all are called God. And yet we're, we've got many verses saying there's only one God. So what do we do with that? Well, I would say, again, any theologian who thinks he understands it, uh, I, don't trust, I don't trust that he understands it as well as he thinks he does, because it's never explained. 
It's simply never explained. So what do I do? Do I say, okay, it doesn't make any sense to me. All these data don't seem to systematize easily. So I'm going to make up a different theory that doesn't, you know, I'll just cut out some of those verses and, uh, and, and make my own theory from verses that, my own selection of verses. But to me, that's not being honest. Uh, honesty requires I don't eliminate any verses. And if I can't understand how they all go together, I'll just have to plead ignorance. I don't know. I don't know how they go together. But I have to say that there's no way I can do justice to all the verses on the subject unless I conclude that God is, in a sense, one God. And in a different sense, he's three somethings. We usually say three persons, and I don't know if that's a good or bad term. I don't mind it, but the Bible doesn't use that term. But we could say there are three in God, and and, and between the three and in God, there's a gap. There's three somethings in God, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are something, and, uh, and yet combined they make only one God. And all the analogies I know that people like to give for water, steam, and ice, or uh, humans with the body, soul, and spirit, or um, uh, eggs with the shell and the white and the yolk. I mean, there's uh, different people have these different ways they try to make sense of it. I don't think any of those necessarily are true analogies. I mean, how can it? How can there be any true analogy of God? Didn't, doesn't the Bible say again and again, "There's none like you, God. Who is like you?" You know. Uh, to what will you be compared? God actually says this. To what will you compare me? Well, lots of people try because we don't like being out of our depth in any discussion. We like to feel like our feet are solidly on the ground. We know exactly where we're standing. Uh, we can explain the whole environment around us from a pretty stable footing. Uh, we, we feel insecure otherwise. But honestly, if there is nothing that is like God, then we can't understand him by analogy to anything else, at least not perfectly. So there's a certain humility required in saying, uh, there are some things about God that he says that thankfully, uh, I, I'm never told that I have to believe them to be saved, but uh, since I want to understand, uh, I think about them. I work, uh, I work on that in my mind. But when all is said and done, I have to say, whatever I come up with is still theory because the Bible never explains it. It just has the data. It's how to synthesize the data into one cohesive theory that that is elusive. So I'm not even I'm not even uh, upset with oneness people. Oneness people, uh, I I get it. I get where they come from. It's hard hard to see it in a trinitarian way, and and I think they're doing their best to try to try to uh, maintain the deity of Christ. You know, obviously they do. They're not like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons that deny the deity of Christ. Oneness people agree that Jesus is God. In fact, they believe he's all there is of God. <laughs> you know, he's he, God is just Jesus, um, which I don't agree with. But but I, I understand their dilemma. So I don't make it a hill to die on. I don't think the Bible makes it a hill to die on. But I would say that theory doesn't work for me. Um, and no theory that I could fully explain does. So... I have to either make up a theory of my own, which means I have to come up with an imaginary God that I created, which is not acceptable. Or I just have to say, I don't fully understand some of this stuff. You know, uh, maybe it'll be clearer when we meet him, you know. But in the meantime, we have to, I, I have to only affirm what the Bible affirms. It does not affirm a Trinity doctrine per se, but it affirms all the elements of a Trinity doctrine. So, so I'm, by default, some kind of Trinitarian. Um, I don't. I don't feel like I have to plant my flag with the Nicene Creed or the Athanasian Creed or any of those Trinitarian creeds. I, not that I disagree with them. I just think they say more than the Bible says on the subject, and they may have got it right or they may not have. But I'm. I'm not against them. I just don't know if I could affirm everything they say. I can only affirm everything the Bible says. But how it all goes together. Uh, if, I think if God wanted us to know, he'd explain it. So we don't like we don't ha like having to live with uncertainty. It's uncomfortable, especially for a preacher or a philosopher or a thinking person. But uh, but there's something also satisfying and childlike in saying, God, you said it. 
you understand it. I don't understand it. I'll take your word for it, you know? And that's kind of where I'm at about that whole subject. Thanks again for your patience, Steve. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. Good to hear from you. It's good to see your face, too. Did you say it's Mike from Inglewood? Yes. Great to, great to see you. Okay. All right. God bless you. All right. And uh, Meme King. Or Mimi. <laughs> yeah, Mimi. the Meme King. I say Mimi. But yeah. um, thank you for taking my, uh, I almost said call, but anyway, allowing me to talk. What you have just talked about kind of, I just want to put this succinct, succinctly. Since I've started listening to you, it has radically changed my Christian walk. What you've done is you've made the Bible so very, very real because you keep saying, this was written to these people. This mm -hmm. is a letter to real people. We, so I'm, I'm been meditating on things like you said, you said, meditate, meditate. So I've, I've come to the conclusion about a couple of things and I want to make a comment and ask what you think about it. Okay. So it's, we have the privilege of having this book written in front of us. But when, after Christ died, there was no book. Right. And right. so the whole Bible that we have now is just explaining the simple message that the apostles were giving, which is Christ died for our salvation, which saved us from the bondage of sin. We don't have to go any longer. And he established a kingdom and we are his kingdom people now. So mm -hmm. love God with all your heart and love people as yourself. That's right. it. That is like really the whole entire message. We just get to read all these different nuances and like how Paul wrote to the Romans, it was specific to them. It may not be specific to us. That is not heretical thinking, is it? No, 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 it's not heretical thinking at all. I don't think that any Christian can use the New Testament uh, responsibly if they don't first ask, what was the reason for this statement being made to these people? Because there was a reason for it. And if we don't have any idea what it is, we might apply it in a way that's irrelevant to what Paul had in mind. Now, on the other hand, I wouldn't say those epistles, because they're written to somebody else, uh, well, they're irrelevant to me. Uh, not no. so, I assume. I assume that every church he wrote to was dealing with issues that I deal with, too, in personal life, personal ethics, personal beliefs, uh, social life, uh, mm -hmm. church life. Uh, so, in other words, I have to recognize that what he wrote to the Philippians or to the Romans is crafted to them uh, to address something about their uh, current Christian situation. But I also recognize that what is true in their current situation, many of those things are true in almost every Christian life. And, and yes. some things, especially in a book like Romans, which contains a lot of theology, not all of the not all of Paul's books do. I mean, like Ephesians and Colossians are books that he, you know, the first half, and they're shorter books, and the first half is theology, the second half is his practical application. Romans isn't divided half and half like that. The first 11 chapters are theology, and then the last, you know, four chapters, uh, well, the last chapter is just greetings for those hearts. So the last three chapters are application. Now, it crowds a lot of application, for example, into chapter 12, but um, the point is that there's more theology in Romans, and that theology is true to, at all times. In other words, it's not just true to them. It's true to, uh, for all times, for all Christians. And therefore, his theology he teaches them is true theology for all Christians of all time. But we do have to recognize that in presenting that theology, he has a reason for bringing those points up to them. For example, I... I used to teach Romans the way I always heard it taught. And most commentaries encourage this, that you know, Romans is more or less not a that personal a letter. It's the most impersonal letter of Paul's. It's mainly just a theological treatise. A lot of commentaries would say, well, Paul was coming to Rome. He'd never been there. He was sending the letter on ahead so they'd know his theology before he got there. And so they say there's hardly any, uh, except for the last chapter, there's no, no personal information about the people at all. And therefore, it's just theology. Now, I used to say that, but I believe now it is, of course, it's theology, 
and it's applicable to all, but there's a specific thing that was going on in that church, just like the other churches Paul wrote to. In that case, I believe it was a friction between the Jewish believers and the, and the Gentile believers. And much of Paul's choice of subject matter is to address that particular problem. And even some of the scriptures he quotes from the Old Testament, which, for example, Calvinists will take as absolute statements in chapter three, there's none that does good, you know, they're all evil, you know, there's there are all these horrible things he quotes from the Psalms and from Isaiah. Calvinists take that as if it's, you know, giving a, a theological anthropology of uh, total depravity, where in fact, as you read the chapter, the verses before that section and afterwards, he's making it very clear. His point is that, yeah, of course, people are all that way. But the main point he's making is that Jews are that way, too, not just Gentiles. He's trying to make the point that Jews have had the opportunity, because they have the oracles of God, to do much better. But then he says, but are we any better? That is, are we Jews any better than Gentiles? He says, no. And then he quotes all these verses about how bad people are who happen to be Jewish people that the psalmist is writing about, you know? Yeah. And at the end of that, that litany of horrible uh, descriptions, Paul says, now we know that what the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Now, by that, he means these verses from the Old Testament, they're addressing those who are under the law, that is the Jews. The Jews. So in other words, instead of uh, trying to just give us a generic anthropology of human sinfulness, uh, in, a, in a vacuum, like the Calvinists want it to be, Paul is trying to make the specific point that not only are Gentiles wicked, but Jews are every bit as wicked. And look at these verses by David and by Isaiah that talk about the Jews in this way. You know, I mean, that's what he's saying. So when you recognize what's actually going on in the church and the division, have specific uh, application to what that church was going through, uh, whereas others uh, who don't see that would just take them in a generic way. But yeah, I think you need to take, first of all, the question when you read a book, who is it written to? Now, some books might have been written to just anyone, but we were talking about Hebrews a moment ago uh, with Jacob, and, um, and uh, you know, I mentioned that, you know, the, the readers of Hebrews were Christian Jews who were abandoning the Christian faith and wanting to go back to Judaism. We know that because, I mean, the, the author mentions that kind of thing several times to his readers. So with that in mind, we understand other passages within it that might otherwise be, you know, perplexing. Anyway, that's, uh, yeah, you're correct. Now, was that the only point? I thought you might have had a No, second. I have a couple. I, I'm so grateful because I was raised Catholic before I became a Christian. And of course, it was like, you can't understand the Bible. Mm -hmm. But making it alive and real to real people has made it alive and real to me. Mm -hmm. And then it made me think about this. Genesis was written by Moses, correct? Yes. Okay. So I was it's thinking. Compiled by Moses. Yeah, at least. Compiled. Yeah. So Adam lived 900 years. That means for 900 years, people had direct access to a person who walked and talked with God. Amazing. And. Yeah. He had to have had lots of stories to share. And so that it would be oral tradition passed on, passed on. So it's like, how close was Moses to a person who had spoken directly with Adam or had touched with Adam? Because it made me trust Genesis even more because I'm thinking there was a reason. And when Adam was after the garden do you think god still came and walked and talked with adam and eve do you think people then still had some contact with god not not with the regularity that they did before the fall uh we do of course we know that enoch who walked was with yeah, he walked with god he was seven generations from adam by the way adam was still alive during the life of enoch uh, Adam lived, I think Adam lived to the life of Methuselah, who was eight generations later than him. Uh, so it's, it's an amazing thing because he lived so long. But because that's true, uh, because Adam was still alive, uh, I believe, when, when Methuselah was alive. And then Methuselah was still alive when Shem was alive. Mm -hmm. And Shem was still alive when Abraham was alive. There's a, there's a span of 2,000 years that's covered in only three generations. I mean, there were more, there were actually 20 generations, but they overlapped each other because people lived so long 
that you could Abraham could have gotten the story of creation from from Shem, who heard it from Methuselah, who heard it from Adam himself. You mm -hmm. know, so even though a lot of times is, is is there, and Abram could easily have written it down. We have uh, archaeologists have many writings that they've discovered, especially the the cuneiform tablets uh, of of Sumeria that that are they predate the time of Abraham. So Abraham could write, and uh, in fact, maybe Shem could too. Maybe Noah could. We don't know. But, I mean, some of these writings could have been by people who actually had contact with Adam himself, uh, because Adam lived so long. Thank you. And my other question, and you don't have to do it now, but maybe sometime on the radio, I was wondering how you would lead somebody to the Lord. And that's my last question. I've led a number of people to the Lord, obviously, but I don't have a I don't have a uh, method. I'm I'm kind of a rebel against methods. Not that methods don't work. Some people use the four spiritual laws. Some people use the way of the master, which is Ray Comfort's method. Uh, some people use the evangelism explosion method, which was put together by a Presbyterian uh, minister. Um, you know, there's uh, the Romans road. People go through Romans three, then six, then you know, on through to to give these developing development of the gospel. All the, people have gotten saved through all those. Uh, I don't use those particularly, though. In talking with someone, I might draw from elements of each of them. When I, I. I don't go out in order to simply uh, convert a person. I want people to be converted. I would love it if everyone I ever talked to ended up converted, but I'm not going to try to force that on them. Now, some, I'm not a, I'm not a, an evangelist per se. I know people who are gifted evangelists, and they, they it just is very natural for them when they strike up a conversation with uh, with a with an, a stranger that within within seconds they're talking very freely and comfortably about the gospel with them. I don't have that magic. Uh, I don't have that uh, that skill. What I what I do is I try to just talk to people uh, and find out if I mean, talk to them like like I would talk to a stranger, even if I wasn't a Christian. So, you know, find out how they're doing, what's going on in their life, and so forth. And then, as soon as possible, ask them you know what their position would be about some issue, which might not always be the same issue, but something that transitions into talking about biblical things or about Christ. I might ask him, what do you think about Jesus Christ? I mean, might be that bold, but that, that, that's sometimes I don't feel comfortable just going right there immediately. Uh, so I don't go in there with the idea that, okay, I'm going to talk to four people this afternoon, and I'm going to lead them all to the point of a sinner's prayer, and then I'm going to go home and tell one four people to Christ. Uh, I'm not... Uh, I don't validate my ministry that way, and, and maybe evangelists have more of that tendency. But my my thought is that a lot of people who come to the Lord through me have come gradually through me, uh, just because of the nature of my contact with them. They maybe hear me on the radio. There was a, a lady I met in Portland who came to one of my meetings. She had her husband with her. She said, I want you to meet my husband. He was an atheist, an adamant atheist, but I was listening to your show all the time. He was overhearing it, and over time, he became a believer. You know, so. Uh, that's kind of what I ex expect to happen more in my ministry, because even even on the radio, I'm not preaching the gospel directly. I mean, as as if my listeners are unbelievers, unless I'm talking to an unbeliever. Uh, I mean, most of the people who call are Christians. I'm not going to artificially give them a come to Jesus message if they're already Christians. I'm going to try to answer their question, and, and that's what most of my show is. So my show is not directly evangelistic, but I think that my whole life is supposed to be uh if not directly, then indirectly evangelistic that people and my radio show too, and everything else. In all my interactions, I try to model Jesus. I try to bring Jesus up when it's relevant. I mean, it might be relevant more than I think it is, but I but at a time I don't think they're gonna feel like I'm some kind of a a guy who's just wants to get another notch on my Bible by leading someone to Christ, because there are people like that. So I'm a little different. If if I were an evangelist rather than a teacher, you know, maybe maybe I'd have some favorite approaches. But uh, I've led a number of people to Christ, of course. But but usually it's not because I sat down and said I'm going to bring this person to the point of a sinner's prayer before this conversation is finished. You know, a lot of times it's through friendship, um, through counseling them in a situation they're in, um, or you know, if they, a lot of times I'll I'll be holding a Bible or something. If they uh, that always gives them a chance to ask, 
you know, why do you carry a Bible? You know, well, I mean, that that transitions into a witnessing opportunity immediately. I always kind of like to have some, I have Jesus on my shirt. I might be carrying a Bible. I might have something that would, if they are curious, that gives them the opportunity to bring the subject up and people often have. Uh, on the other hand, it might make them run away the other direction or make make them very careful not to let the subject come up because they see some of the Bible and think, I don't want to talk about that right now. And if they don't, I'm not going to chase them. I, I figure if God isn't calling them or, or if he's not drawing them at that moment, then I will i won't be able to draw them. But if he is drawing them, then they're going to have a heart for it. So I just try to read the situation and the person and uh, and I do what I can to do what I think Jesus would do. Uh, and to represent him. And sometimes, as a result, we have conversations where people get saved. Other times, sometimes people get saved over a long period of acquaintance or listening to the show or something else. So I can't give a, a lot of people would like to know what method I would use, but I don't have a particular method I use. I have more of a philosophy of it rather than a method. I think I was coming from the point of uh, not having a quick pray this center prayer and then you're saved, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Because now I, I'm i more emphasizing being part of the kingdom of God and being a disciple than you anything should. else. You should. And, I, and I think maybe in a conversation that, that is amenable to it, to ask somebody, you know, uh, what really is it that they're living for? I mean, uh, they go to work. They go to work every day. They get up in the morning. They feed themselves. They take care of their responsibilities. But is there uh, any transcendent meaning to their life? Is there any, is there anything that uh, joins those individual beads together on one thread? You know, what is it that they are actually living for? Um, many people simply don't know. They, they never even thought about it. And once you, you know, once once that comes up, they they can either tell you what they're living for, or more likely they say, "I'm not really 100 percent sure what I'm living for." And you say, well, okay, if I tell you what I think we should all be living for, you know, I think we should be living for, you know, uh, the program that God has for our lives, which is to acknowledge his son as our king and to become his followers. And that's what, that's the reason we're born. That's the reason we're in this world. That's the reason that you and I are having this conversation. Uh, that's the reason that you have breath, uh, is that God wants you to come to know him and become uh, a part of his big plan. Um, you know, it's not a buttonholing kind of a witness, but it's uh, it's it's the basic message. Of course, it can lead to more specifics if they take the bait. <laughs> Let me quickly talk to uh, Mark. Uh, Mark, welcome. I had a question that's kind of twofold about the Revised Standard Version. I had this Bible since I was in eighth grade uh -huh. and uh, for 40 some years. Mine. That's when my church gave me mine, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Revised standard. And, uh, then I started just recently in Bible study. We've been talking about the King James Version being better than that. Well, anyway, I've never read the preface until uh, like a month ago. And in the, uh, at the, in the preface, it says, the King James Version of the New Testament was based upon a Greek text that was marred by mistakes, containing the accumulated errors of 14 centuries of manuscript copying and it just goes on to kind of explain why the Revised Standard Version was necessary. And apparently it was written or uh, translated by a Bruce Metzger, New Testament, and the Old Testament by Herbert May. So my first question, I guess, was uh, what is your impression of them as being translators? Okay, well, uh, first of all, Bruce Metzger is a very respected Greek Bible scholar and textual scholar. Uh, I don't agree with him about everything, but he's way above my level uh, in, in the Greek language and textual criticism. But what he's expressing is the opinion of many uh, modern Bible scholars, namely that the what they call the, uh, we could call the Alexandrian text of the New Testament, which is the, uh, there, there's the Vaticanus, there's the, the Alexandrinus, uh, there's the Sinaiticus. These are three different manuscripts that are the oldest ones we know of, of the New Testament. But they were not discovered until after the King James Version came into being. So when the King James was made in, in 1611, although there were older manuscripts in existence, scholars had not found them yet. 
And so the, the, the King James was translated from manuscripts that were a bit later and, and, and had some differences from the earlier ones. And so the assumption of the scholars is that those differences in the Textus Receptus, which the King James used, reflect uh, errors in copying. Now, there's no question that errors have occurred in copying. There are over 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament that have been found, and they're not all identical because some a copyist, a person who copied them, made a mistake here and there. Now, uh, either, either the King James use of the Textus Receptus was the use of a flawed manuscript, or the RSV's use of the Alexandrian text was the use of a flawed manuscript, or what I think is more likely, both of them had some flaws uh, in certain places. They, they had different flaws. Now, someone might get really scared and say there's flaws in the manuscript. Well, frankly, we have to just live with that. I mean, anyone knows there's 5,000 manuscripts. They don't all say exactly the same thing word for word. But to put your mind at rest, the differences between them are of no consequence. Uh, there are thousands of little places in the older manuscripts where the, the the text reads slightly differently than the later manuscripts. So one of those sets is probably closer to the original than the other. But even the one that's the furthest doesn't change anything. You know, the kinds of things you call differences, or that they would call differences, are this. In, in there's a Let's just say there's a passage where Paul writes, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says that in, in some of the manuscripts. But other manuscripts just say our Lord Jesus. And the word Christ isn't in there. Someone who was copying it forgot to copy the word Jesus. So one manuscript says our Lord Jesus Christ. One just says our Lord Jesus in the same passage. One of them is closer to the original than the other, but it doesn't really matter too much because uh, whether you're talking about our Lord Jesus Christ or our Lord Jesus, you're talking about the same person. And even the even the manuscript that leaves out the word Jesus in that passage does not leave it out in the rest of the New Testament. It's not like somehow that manuscript has excised the name of Jesus from the New Testament. Uh, it's just a mistake. Somebody copied it wrong, and, and you can easily see that it's not saying something different. And okay. almost, almost all the differences that exist in manuscripts are of virtually no consequence. They uh, word order changes. Sometimes a word is misspelled in one manuscript, and that's different than the one that isn't misspelled. So those are the kind of things that are differences. You, you it doesn't really matter which manuscript you use, you're going to get the message of the New Testament pretty un, un, uh, unadulterated. Okay, so part two of the question that kind of relates to that, it's, um, I, I don't have it with me, but I know there's a whole, like, paragraph or two that the Revised Standard Version just left out from what the, the King Mark James Version says. Yeah, at the end of Mark, at the end of Mark, there's 12 verses. Uh, in uh, in John, there's a section of several verses, which is essentially is the story of the woman taken in adultery. And now why do you think they left those out? They left those out because they weren't in the manuscripts that they were using. That is, the okay. old manuscripts didn't contain those verses. Now, the question is, should they have? Uh, that's what we don't know for sure. The, the older manuscripts did not have them. Uh, most of the older, the new, the newer manuscripts do, and so uh, do the newer manuscripts actually retain the original text accurately, or do the older manuscripts retain it accurately? We can't just say we know the answer because one's older than the other, because an older manuscript could be flawed, and one a manuscript that was actually produced uh, newer could have retained a uh, better reading. Something. And so, that was the big, the big kerfluffle back in the early fifties when it came out. The RSV came out was uh, uh, Isaiah seven fourteen. Oh yeah, the young woman. Yeah, the, the yeah. young woman versus a virgin because they yeah. didn't call it. So I don't know. Well, the There's problem. An accusation. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the problem there, of course, is that the word Alma, the Hebrew word translated virgin or young woman, uh, the word Alma does mean a young woman, but it's never used that we know of in a case where the young woman in question was not a virgin. Um, so we don't have any examples where Alma means a young woman who is not a virgin. But the word itself doesn't have to mean a virgin. It just always seems to in, in, in the Bible. Uh, but here's the thing. 
the Bible is translated into Greek around seven, uh, around 275 BC uh, into what we call the Septuagint. And when the Greek translators, who were Jews prior to the time of Christ, were translated Isaiah 714, and they found the word Alma, which means young woman or virgin, they translated with the Greek word Parthenos, which means a virgin specifically. So the Jewish translators who translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek believed that Alma was referring to a virgin, and this is long before Jesus came. So it's not as if the Christians, you know, pretended that Isaiah was uh, predicting a virgin birth in order to somehow make a, a case for Jesus. Uh, but actually, the Jews themselves recognized that it was referred to a virgin by the use of the word Parthenos, which does not mean a young woman. It means a virgin. So, um, you know, it is true. The word Alma can mean a young woman. And, and uh, a translator like the RSV that translates it as your young woman may very well be trying to deny the virgin birth of Christ, or they may not be. What they may be intending to do is point out that the prophecy has sort of a partial fulfillment in the next chapter with Isaiah's child born to a young woman, but that that child is a type and a shadow of Christ who would be born of an actual virgin. And since the word Alma can refer to either, they might have chosen that in order to be able to include the fulfillment in, in Isaiah 8. It's a little complicated to talk about briefly, but uh, there, there's, yeah, the, it is but true. It is true that the RSV is preferred by more liberal Christians than the King James is. And this is, of course, one reason that conservative Christians have never flocked to the RSV. I would I, think if they were if they were going to try to deny the deity of Christ, though, in that verse, then the new, they would have changed the New Testament, like Jehovah's Witnesses changed, you know, their Bible to say what they wanted. You would think so, but they, but they couldn't because the New Testament uses the Greek Parthenos, and therefore they, they could not honestly translate that young woman in Matthew yeah. 1. All right. Thanks, sir. All right. Good talk to you, Mark. Yep. Thanks for this. Mike and Lisa Smith. Hi. These are my friends in Arizona. I'm actually going to come to their church in February. Hey, Steve. Thanks for uh, taking my well, I almost had my call. <laughs> um, hi, you guys. Yeah, I can't wait to see you in February, Steve. So I just would like for you to pick up um, one or two of Jesus's parables and just kind of share what you think, like some of the harder ones. You pick it, though. I'm just going to let you pick one. <laughs> well, the hardest of Jesus' parables, in my opinion, is Luke 16, 1 and following, uh, the, the the unjust uh, steward. Um that parable begins by uh, a man, a wealthy man, learns that one of his stewards, his man managers of his business, has cheated him. And he calls him on the floor and says, uh, make up uh, uh, an account of your of your dealings because you're going to be fired. I want you to turn in your books. And so the guy has not yet been fired, but he knows he's going to be fired real quick. So he's got to got to act quickly to do something and use any opportunity he can for his uh, future security. So he decides to use his position to make some sweet deals with some of the people who owe his master money so that they'll like, he'll ingratiate himself to them so that when he's unemployed, maybe they'll employ him or they'll bring him in. And that's what the deal is. Now, when the master found out he had done it, of course, this had been at the master's expense because he reduced, yeah, he, he reduced the, uh, uh, the amount that the clients had to pay and yet it says the master commended the steward. This is what makes it difficult. Uh, he commended him for his shrewdness. And, and then Jesus says, and so you also need to, uh, you know, make good use of the mammon of unrighteousness. Uh, so uh, make friends with it, he said, so that they will receive you into everlasting habitations when, when it fails. Now, the problem, what's difficult with this parable is that the, the main guy that we are, in a sense, uh, told to be like happens to be kind of crooked uh and and it's it's strange that his master doesn't uh you know scold him for it but rather commends him for it and i uh i have to assume just from that those very facts that the deals that were made by the steward although they they were at the expense of his master 
they didn't cut they didn't cut him too deep they they didn't hurt him much you know he was wealthy enough that he could take a bit of a loss like that and it might even of course uh since the servant was acting in his master's name allegedly uh it could even ingratiate the master to his clientele you know that he gave those good deals i mean there's a sense in which the master might not have been hurt very much by those discounts and and there might even be an upside to it but the main thing was he commended the servant for being so quick-witted in in looking out for his future uh, with the with the short time he had to do anything he only had a few days in all likelihood and he jumped to it and made provision for his long-term security this way now what jesus tells us to do is to use our opportunities he says the mammon of unrighteousness which means money but you know money is only one kind of opportunity we need to steward the opportunities we have because we know our time is short this steward knew that he was going to be fired and he'd be out on the street, but he wanted long-term security. So Jesus says, hey, think like that. You've got short-term opportunity to do with your opportunities for God things that will welcome you into everlasting habitations when you're done here. In other words, life is short, but eternity is long. And if you'll be like this steward, he saw his opportunities were short to make provision for his long-term well-being. Well, think that way Jesus said he's not saying to be cheat a uh, cheater or anything like that he's just saying uh you should have the the foresight and the wisdom to do that thank you um well current events have obviously uh, reinvigorated uh discussions around eschatology and um what I'm kind of I listen to your lectures on this and so I find um I guess what I'm looking for is maybe some help from you on what's the if I were to just if you were to distill down um, and maybe get the quote elevator speech for someone to just question the foundations of dispensationalism, not I'm not trying to turn them over and and have them change their view in one conversation, but just spark uh, have a catalyst for them to go back and do some studying. Uh, how, what would you what would you say? <laughs> what would be your elevator speech, for lack of a better term? I would say, um, think of the scriptures that you use to prove any part of dispensation. You could say of the uh, preacher of rapture or of the uh, restoration of Israel in the end times as a nation. Uh, those are the two main innovations of dispensation. I would say, think of all the scriptures you would use for that and look at them in context and ask, uh, these, let's say about the restoration of Israel, what is there about them that has not been fulfilled long ago? And why would you then think that they must be fulfilled in the end times? Um, that Just get them scratching their head about that a little bit and uh, get them doing their own research. Now, unfortunately, many okay. will we'll just ask their dispensational pastor and he'll give them some kind of, I believe, an evasion. Right. Well, that's what I'm... Uh, and, I, and I have to be... I'm, I, I was a victim of... Not a victim, but I, I certainly... I, I was raised in the, in the time when that was the prominent teaching. So, do so. That's what I find a lot when I uh, have these kind of exchanges is they never really even question the the teaching itself. So, yeah, I would just say question it. Know that it's not a historic teaching. It's it's a very new teaching, and uh, and when it first came up in the 1800s, conservative Christians thought of it as they called it liberalism because it was uh, an innovative new doctrine. That was very uh, that denied what historic Christians had taught. Uh, of course, we live 150 years after that time, or 200 years almost after that time, and uh, and it's just the environment we were raised in. You know, we were uh, we were born, and and it was this temperature. You know, but if you're in if you're 150 years earlier, as it was as the mindset of Christians was turning this way, you would have recognized the difference from what you had been seen in scripture previously but some people don't know anything about the bible except that they learn from dispensational churches now so um <laughs> just let them know that not everyone has thought this way and you might want to just recheck some of those scriptures that you're leaning on all right thank you so much all right a uh, jim from staten island welcome uh, mm -hmm. i got three quick questions you can answer them after i ask them if you don't mind in acts one is that spiritual Israel or is that national Israel? One when, six? The apostles, when the apostles, 
uh, yeah, when the apostles came and asked him, Will you again, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? That's the first question. The second question is regarding sheep. Were the sheep always sheep? Do you believe the sheep were always sheep? Or do you believe the goats were always goats? There was two groups. In okay. other words, and then the third question is, did you ever believe in the doctrines of grace? And if you did, when did you stop and why? Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Acts 1-6, uh, will you at this time uh, restore the kingdom of Israel? They're probably thinking of the nation of Israel. And they were probably thinking in terms of uh, the way the Jews thought because they hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet. They were not, they were not spiritual minded people yet. But uh, Jesus did, of course, restore this, the uh, kingdom to Israel, but not in the way that they were probably thinking, because uh, the kingdom uh, was different than they were thinking. They were thinking of a political kingdom, and it was more spiritual. And Israel was not what they were thinking, because uh, they are not all Israel who are of Israel, Paul says. They, uh, you know, there's a new Israel made up of the followers of Christ. So I believe they meant probably national Israel. Uh, but Jesus didn't take the time because he's going to ascend like three seconds later into heaven. He didn't take the time to correct them. He just said, I just, you know, go about your business and be a witness and, you know, don't worry about these things. So uh, now uh, the the second thing I said, are the sheep and the goats, uh, can goats become sheep? Can sheep become goats? Well, no, literal sheep cannot become goats and literal goats can't become sheep. Uh, but Jesus is not saying that the people in this parable are literally sheep or literally goats. He says basically that he's going to divide the nations at the time of the judgment when he comes back into two categories, the way a shepherd separates sheep and goats. The goats go one direction, the sheep go another direction. It's an analogy. But but uh, at the time of judgment, everyone is by, at, that's the last day, everyone's either a sheep or a goat then. Now, whether the, whether some of them were once sheep and they became goats, and some were once goats and they became sheep, is not really in the purview of the parable. They, they, it's not talking about whether anyone ever changed from one thing to another thing. It's talking about the way they are found to be at the judgment. When Jesus comes back, collects them up, some are like the goats who go one direction, some are like the sheep go another. So he's not really addressing whether those people could become something, a different kind of people. Uh, nor is he even raised the question of whether sheep can become goats or goats can become sheep. He's, he's talking about the way things will be found at the judgment. What they were like in those people's lives earlier in their lives is a, a totally separate uh, concern. Now, did I ever hold to the doctrines of grace? And for those of you who don't know, that means Calvinism. Uh, I never, I never knew the doctrines of grace and held them. But in the church I was raised in, I think we we thought we knew them and and thought we believed some of them. Uh, there's five points of Calvinism. I think the people in my Baptist church I grow, grew up in, at least the ones who are knowledgeable, including myself, uh, would have said we probably hold about three of the five points. Probably would have been three-point or three-and-a-half-point Calvinists, as some Baptists say they are. Now, you really can't be a three-point Calvinist because the five points uh, are uh, logically inseparable. If you accept the first one, you really can't escape the other four. Uh but the reason we thought we were three-point is because we didn't understand the three that we thought we believed. For example, I would have said I believed in uh, total depravity, uh, which is the first point. Well, uh, to me, total depravity just do you believe everyone's a sinner? You know, everyone needs to be saved and everyone's, everyone's depraved. Uh, yeah, of course. But I didn't know that total depravity had the special Calvinistic meaning that someone in that condition can't repent or can't believe or can't be converted unless God forces that on them. I didn't believe that. And similar with some of the other points. So we would the points that I thought I believed, once I understood what Calvinism actually said about those points, I realized I never really believed them. I never really believed those points the way a Calvinist does. So no, I never was a Calvinist. I was not opposed to Calvinism when I didn't fully understand it. And I didn't fully understand it until I was probably in my late 20s or early 30s. And when I did, when I was reading the Calvinists themselves, I realized, right, that's not what the Bible says. I don't believe that at all. I never did. So the answer is no, I never really did hold to those doctrines. Thank you. All right, Dwight, you made it. You're our last <laughs> man. You're our last man. Go oh, ahead. wow. Thank you. Um, three quick questions. Uh, when did the Catholic Church begin? 
Um, and in your opinion, when did the Catholic Church become the man of lawlessness? And the last question, is the Catholic Church still the man of lawlessness, even though they are not killing their opponents today? All right. Uh, first of all, when did the Catholic Church start? Well, the word Catholic means universal. If you mean the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic, yes. Right, the Roman Catholic Church, I, it's hard to say when that started because it evolved. You see, there was a church in Rome from the time of the apostles on, but they didn't hold the views of Roman Catholicism in those days. Those evolved. And what happened was uh, there was what they called the Catholic or Universal Church, like at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, those who held to the dominant view were, were were Catholic Christians. Now, there was no such thing as Roman Catholics in those days. They were, just, they were Catholic, just means they're part of the universal Christian faith, as opposed to the heretics who were not. Um, but eventually, especially after Constantine was converted, he was the emperor of Rome, and he gave great favor to the church in Rome, the, the bishops of Rome, of the Roman Church, uh, you know, began to have much more prestige. First of all, being in Rome was prestigious enough because it was the empire's capital, is the most powerful city in the empire. So just being there. But then when the emperor elevated Christianity, then its leaders were, of course, had even more influence and more power. And although there was, it was never official that these bishops of Rome had any say over what churches elsewhere did, uh, it just eventually came to the point where uh, bishops of other parts of the world would consult with the bishops in Rome just because they kind of had a default sort of prestige. Uh, Augustine, writing um, maybe almost, uh, almost 100 years after Constantine's conversion, uh, advocated that the bishops of the churches should submit to the bishops of Rome. Now, he's, Augustine is often said to be the father of Roman Catholicism, as well as the father of the Reformation, because the Reformers were Augustinian too. But uh, Augustine uh, and his view of the popes had a lot to do, or, or the bishop of Rome, Rome, had a lot to do with uh, elevating that bishop to the point that he was over the other bishops of the other churches. But even then, you didn't have the papacy as we currently have it, uh, because many of the powers of the popes were not defined or affirmed or claimed until uh, even a couple centuries after that. Uh, I mean, they developed. Over time, the popes began to claim a little more and a little more and a little more. You know, we Protestants know that the Catholics believe in the infallibility of the pope when he speaks ex cathedra. That view was not held until fairly recent centuries. I mean, mm -hmm. the, church, the church has followed the pope and gave him extreme power, but the idea that he was infallible was never declared to be true until one of the more recent councils in the, in, in the past few centuries. But these the, the powers of the Pope evolved, which means that the church that had been the true universal church began to take on more and more of the traditions and what I would call the corruptions of the Roman Catholic papacy. Now, exactly when the papacy could be said to have become the man of lawlessness, which is what the reformers believed it was, um, well, the church fathers thought the land of lawlessness would fall, would, would rise on the fall of Rome. That was in the late 500s. Uh, in, in the year 600, Pope Gregory the Great is sometimes said to be the first actual pope in the modern sense of the word. Now, there were, you know, bishops of Rome had a lot of prestige before his time, but, but you know, it's almost like when the Roman Empire fell, the bishop of Rome kind of moved into that power vacuum and, you know, conducted the politics as well as the religious leadership of the Roman Empire. Um, and so, you know, he, he got almost uh, unlimited power. And so when did this become a bad deal? Uh, well, it's probably not a very good deal, even at that time. But uh, Paul thought the man of sin would rise uh, when, when that which hindered it is taken out of the way. The, the reformers believed that what was taken out of the way was the Roman Empire at the fall of the last emperor, and that uh, the man of sin was the papacy that rose on it. So around, frankly, late late 500s, early 600s, now Pope Gregory was a fine guy, but the institution of the papacy took on characteristics that made the Pope almost 
politically irresistible and with absolute power, there, often there's absolute corruption that comes with it. And, and within, you know, within generations, there were popes that were absolute monsters and began to persecute the, the dissenters. They persecute the Waldenses, the Paulicians, and eventually the Lollards, the Wycliffeites, and, and then eventually the Reformers. In that sense that the Reformers believed that the, the Pope was the Antichrist and the man of sin. Now, um, is he? Uh, is the papacy the man of sin? I don't know. I mean, I often say, uh, I know that the Reformers made a pretty good case for it, and uh, uh, but not all Protestants believe it. And I'm not sure that we're compelled to believe it. It, it seems real reasonable to see it their way. Um, but it, but if so, is the papacy still, you know, anti-Christ as it was? Well, some of the popes have probably been Christians. I don't know. But some of them seem like they've acted like Christians. But an awful lot of them have definitely not been Christians. And... Um, the papacy has not seen its last generation yet, unless this is it. Uh, and, you know, the direction the papacy is going right now with the particular pope, is it Francis we have now, um, is is not one that even conservative Catholics like. Uh, Protestants are not, I mean, conservative Protestants would not go along with it. And even conservatives Catholics do not like this pope because he's kind of woke. And uh, mm -hmm. who knows? Who knows what direction the papacy will go? It may show itself to be a true antichrist, you know, uh, unmasked eventually. I don't know. I I'm not a Catholic basher. I'm not even a Pope basher. Uh, pope John Paul, for example, I thought was a pretty decent guy, but I disagreed, of course, with him. But I I thought he could be a, a sincere Christian. But uh, the thing about the papacy is that even if a even if a sincere Christian holds that office uh, in one generation. There's no guarantee the next guy is going to be a sincere Christian. Yeah, you know, right. It's the, it's the office that continues, not the individuals in it. So, the papacy can have its seasons of being not so monstrous, and other seasons where it's hideously monstrous. And uh, since mm -hmm. we haven't, we probably haven't seen the last pope yet. It's it's impossible for me to predict, uh, really. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Hey, uh, we've gone pretty late, more than usual, but I'm glad we got to get to all the hands that were up uh, and uh, not everyone survived the whole time, but uh, there's still 18 people with us. I appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, Mike Lucas, are you still with us? Why don't you close in prayer for us, bro? Sure. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this time with Steve. We thank you for just the opportunity and with the technology that we can all gather and um, be able to see each other's faces and ask questions, Lord. We thank you for Steve's uh, knowledge and the time that he's put together just uh, studying the Bible and, and his willingness and desire to uh, help us all to grow. Lord, I uh, just pray that you'll uh, take care of anyone's needs here in this meeting um, and just in the whole audience of Steve Grace, Lord, just uh, take care of all the needs that people have and the desires and the, the pains, Lord, uh, help us to seek you better. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.